It's happening in every neighborhood. Down every street. Domestic violence is turning countless Australian family homes into crime scenes. Slowly, doors are opening. Victims are speaking out. Pressure is mounting on police to strengthen their resolve and their responses, and governments and courts to change laws. But will any of this change the men who still think violence is OK? I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we go behind closed doors to investigate Australia's hidden epidemic of domestic violence. West Australia's southern coast is serenely beautiful, but it wasn't the stunning vistas that lured Sandy Wolf to Albany in June 2014. After more than a decade of abuse, she was fleeing her violent partner and had checked into a local women's refuge. But instead of finding the safety she hoped for, there was only danger. Just a few days after she arrived, a drive to pick up her daughter from school turned into a nightmare. As I was starting to leave town, that's when Mark comes up behind me in the black Commodore. Sandy's partner was on the hunt for her when he spotted her blue car on the highway. I just wanted to get away from him, that's all I kept thinking. Another driver, Sam Goodall, was travelling behind Sandy. He's pushed her off to the side of the road a bit and um, tried to stop in front of her. And I hit the kerb on that side and I jam on the brakes. I noticed that she was quite stressed out and she was signalling to me, um, call someone or help. Ring the cops, you know, do something, ring the police. Sam tried to intervene, blocking Mark's car so that Sandy could get away. But her former partner continued the chase. Finally ramming her car, catapulting her off the highway, the car rolling two and a half times. After all the other times, I gave Mark plenty of chances because I thought that there was something worth holding on for. But for him to do what he did that day just showed a, a total, total disrespect for me. He doesn't love me. And I, the man that I loved died a long time ago. And he's been replaced by this monster who lives in his skin. That was the hard thing was to, to look at him like that and realise that that's not, not my mark anymore. Disrespecting women does not always result in violence against women. But all violence against women begins with disrespecting women. Australia's Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is putting domestic violence at the top of the national agenda. Violence against women is one of the great shames of Australia. It is a national disgrace. One of the world's wealthiest countries, it's hard to believe that beneath its shiny facade lies such an ugly secret. One that pervades all walks of life. It may happen out of sight, but the statistics are staggering. One in four women experience domestic violence from an intimate partner. Half a million children witness it, and every year more than 50 women are killed as a result of it. I think we do focus, and as we should, on, the, um, on deaths, because that is the ultimate in domestic violence. But there would be um, hundreds hundreds of women live into near-death experience every day in Australia. The government has pledged more than 70 million US dollars to help tackle the crisis. But what causes domestic violence and what needs to change to stop it? He was nice, funny, considerate. He was a really nice guy, really nice guy. Sandy was barely out of her teens when she met Mark Burt and Hi. fell in love. That's him with our firstborn, Ashley. Proud dad. He liked it. But three children later, Sandy's loving relationship had disappeared. When I was going through the abuse with Mark, I used to think quite often, how did we get here? When did this start? 
According to Sandy, things changed in 1999 when Mark hurt his back and could no longer work, Sandy becoming his full-time carer. But reading between the lines, it seems there were problems from the start. He was always very controlling. He liked me being at home. That's one reason why he liked us being on the farm. When he was working, he always knew that I was at home, that he knew where I was. <laughs> um, so did you feel like you couldn't go out? Yeah, and, and not without asking permission to. And as is typical in domestic violence cases, when Sandy began to challenge his control, the relationship deteriorated dramatically. I've told you before. I was just getting sick of it. I got to a stage where I didn't like the constriction on my life anymore. I used to say to him, you know, it's like you don't trust me. I started to stand up for myself more. He would get so annoyed with it. And of course, then in anger, he would lash out. The first time Mark hit Sandy, he smashed her teeth and gave her two black eyes. What we have to understand is that that person has always been violent. It's about power and control. It's about something that changed that he wasn't happy with, that changed, that made that violence become worse. That first time, um, he, he was remorseful afterwards. Um, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do it, you know, all, all that kind of thing. And he bought me flowers and gifts. But the second time when it happened, his attitude afterwards had changed. Instead of being remorseful or whatever, he was more like, oh, well, you deserved it. And so began the psychological conditioning. As happens to many victims of abuse, Sandy started to believe him. I viewed it as my fault a little um, because I did provoke Mark and I shouldn't really because I know the consequences of what will happen. But by now, as their son Aidan tells us, there was a new partner in their relationship, the methamphetamine ice. It got worse once he started using the drugs. It went from, you know, just yelling at, at you to and just smacking you every now and again to like beating, beating you hurt mum like, really bad and stuff like A drug does not make him do that. He, a drug just takes away the rest of the guilt that goes with it. On occasions, Sandy was literally tortured into submission. He dragged me out of the car and pulled the gun out of the back and put it under my, under my chin and said, this is it. This is what you're going to get if you don't cut it out. You won't do as you're frickin' told. Such acts of psychological terror left no visible evidence of trauma. But the punches and objects thrown at her have left permanent scars. That is from a mobile phone. Yeah. Good shot, eh? Split like a watermelon. Unbelievable. God, the pain. Sandy's children may have maintained appearances, but the torment was taking its toll on them too. Did you ever worry about the fact that, you know, she could be killed? Yes. Sometimes I thought that if she was to die, that we were all going to die as well. And, because uh, he always used to say that it was going to take our lives and then mum's and then his all the time, so yeah. Emily, she used to always go to her room and always cry about it and stuff. I'd come in there and sit with her and tell her it was all right. That's, that's my mum would be all right. She, she can take it. Sandy wasn't the only victim. Her son, Aidan, says his father would beat him with a belt and lock him in the bathroom just for biting his fingernails. He'd check them every day and ask if I had bitten my nails and if I did or if I didn't, he'd still give me a flogging for it and put in, put in the bathroom and sat there. For how many years did that go on? 
I remember sitting in that in that room for about seven years. Aidan says he was only let out to go to school and to do chores. I remember that room, like the back of my hand. I remember counting the tiles on the floor a million times. We hear of that quite often and, um, you know, children have been left in bedrooms only coming out for short periods of time, almost from birth. And um, we've had children in, in our centre where, you know, they've got to two, three years old and can't walk and talk because the father has kept them. And that is a way of keeping the mum there. In late 2013, fearing for her life after Mark had threatened her over the phone, Sandy made her first ever triple zero emergency call to police. But by the time they arrived, Mark was already home and convinced them there was nothing wrong. Sandy was too terrified to speak out in front of Mark. Why they didn't separate us, God only knows. It's the first thing that they do. So really, so you get a chance to talk. If you'd had a chance that night... I would have told them what was going on. I would have said, well, guess what? You better get me the hell out of here because he has just stabbed me in the back of the leg with a knife. When he first opened the door, he's holding the, the doorknob with the knife in hand and they can't see it. And I'm sort of in the mode of, like, if I say something, then he's going he's gonna to lurch at me and... To keep safe, I'm not going to. I'm just going to keep playing the game with Mark and be compliant. Exactly the reason why Soon after that, Mark moved the family to a remote property. Because of the triple zero incident, we were moving to somewhere where they didn't know where we were. Out here, the violence escalated to the point where Sandy left the family home and confided in a friend and survivor of domestic violence who persuaded her to go to the police. I'd never told anyone anything about it and keeping a secret like that is... You can't tell other people. It just, you just physically cannot actually say the words. These women do actually feel judged. They do feel shame, they're scared of the future, so it's vital for the very first person that a woman tells about her domestic violence that she's believed and that it's validated, because that might be the only opportunity that that woman has. The policewoman Sandy spoke to convinced her to take out a restraining order, not allowing Mark to come within 10 metres of her. But as often happens, within weeks, Sandy was back with Mark and the kids. I was lonely. I didn't like being away from the kids and not knowing what was happening. In being there, I could oversee things and I'd made sure that um, some of his shady mates that I didn't like didn't come to the house, didn't come anywhere near my children. But the violence only got worse. A few weeks later, Mark drove Sandy to an isolated rest area late at night. Here, he put a noose around her neck and threatened to hang her from a tree. I was standing on my tippy toe, holding on, and I was screaming at him, Mark, Mark, please stop. Yeah, and then he decides that that's enough. Taught her a lesson. Rope became Mark's weapon of choice, but next time there would be a witness to the horror. I was in the house and. Mum and Dad had been at each other all day. He had hit me a few times with this wooden wooden bar. Wasn't satisfied with that. So he grabbed a, a small extension cord and um, I was in on the on the ground covered and he was whipping me across the back. And then Dad told her to come over to the shed. I remember seeing Dad tying something to his ute and he put the rope around Mum's neck. And he says, I want to see you run. So he gets in the car, starts up. He says, come on, dog. <laughs> see you run. Run, dog. Come on, dog. No, oh, so she's, she's going to die. I was like, I don't want to be here for this. 
write a note on the piece of paper and said, oh, oh, I'm not coming back. An anonymous emergency call reporting the incident was made later that afternoon, but it was two days before the police responded. Mark was arrested, held overnight and fined for breaching the restraining order. Sandy sought protection in a refuge, but just a week later, Mark ran her off the road. On the other side of the country, in the state of Queensland, police are working to close the gaps in the system that leave victims like Sandy vulnerable. They're trialling a specialist domestic violence unit. Its coordinator, Larissa Shaw, is herself a survivor of domestic violence. I often use my experience to encourage women to speak and, and I'll say, look, this is what's happened to me. So we were working with the... You can share that. And you can share the experience not only with the victims that you deal with, but also your fellow colleagues to say, you know, please don't say, why doesn't she just leave? Because there's more to it. And this is why. The officers meet regularly to discuss the most serious cases and work out a comprehensive plan of action to keep victims safe. So what sort of injuries did she have? She had been whipped, um, beaten with hammers. Okay. It was not an injury body that didn't contain a bruise or bruising. The woman they're talking about had been abused for 18 years. In high-risk cases such as this, restraining orders have limited effect, according to Acting Superintendent Glenn Allen. If someone's intent is to do harm or kill, maim, torture somebody, I don't think a domestic violence is going to stop it. However, it provides us, as the police service, uh, an instrument which we can prosecute. Our new focus is to pursue the criminal offence as well. And that often means that we have to get a complaint from the victim, which is often hard. So where the cases are, are severe, we've taken that onus off the victim and just take action. At the same time as taking a tough stance, the new approach is to work with all parties. What we've seen is if we can uh, work with the family, work with the victim, and in cases work with the perpetrator, we're going to stop the re-victimisation of the woman in most cases. And if we can work with the, the perpetrator to stop his behaviour, then we're, not, we're going to see less repeat calls. Stand by. All right, sound, camera, market. Jerry Redford passionately believes it's possible to change the behaviour of perpetrators and says he's living proof of it. What are you doing? Oh, I'm going out with Julie. Why are you dressed like that? Like what? Yeah, when you're going out with your mates for lunch, looking like a, a whore. For me, what I've experienced and seen, the, the power of ego in, in manifesting in anger, violence and rage is, is one of the core sort of causes of, of violence and abuse in a relationship. Having to be right, having to be in control, having to have power. And maybe that's a parting shot, is that your hands are around a throat. You know what? Now making educational films with a strong message that violence is a choice, some of the scenes are uncomfortably close to Jerry's own past behaviour. The worst point was the realising that um, I could actually really hurt my wife physically. Having a hand around her throat and holding her against the wall and, and um, screaming at her and letting her go and walking away and her saying, like, you, you nearly strangled me or you were strangling me then and turning around and saying, I should have stabbed you and really feeling that. You know, when, um, in retrospect, when you feel how frightening that rage is, you never want to go there again. It is the most terrifying, out of control place to be. It became a stain on me as a person. Like, and, and the more I did it, the worse it became. Jerry's marriage eventually ended. He later enrolled in a six month program for perpetrators but stayed for two years and faced up to the hard truth that he alone was responsible for his violence. What's going on with the bloke in there? What bloke? 
the bloke in there, what's his name? No, seriously, babe, you know what makes me feel uncomfortable, yeah? No, I can't use that, so it makes me feel uncomfortable. The message Jerry conveys in his films is that perpetrators need to stop blaming others for their behaviour. Okay, okay. What's magical is the moment that I take responsibility and say, wow, I feel vulnerable or I feel uncomfortable. I can then realise that it's my choice to make. Why should domestic violence... Jerry's adamant, punishment must be combined with help and support for violence to stop. The system today is flawed because in putting a restraining order in place, yes, we're protecting people and that's really important. And that would have been necessary then for that, for my partner then, absolutely. It wouldn't have helped me stop what I was doing because it wouldn't address the core behavior and it wouldn't address the feelings and what's going on underneath that behavior. And all we're doing is moving violent men from one relationship to another. It's really politically unattractive to offer support for people that use violence, abusers. But until that's done, I don't think anything's, that, nothing's gonna change. Get in the car. You know what? Stop ya. I've taken off as quick as I can behind him just to try and make sure I stay with her. Yeah. Um, and then as you'll see next, um, they collide. It's just... Sam Goodall's dash camera captured Sandy's partner, Mark, ramming her off the road. I pulled him off to the side and he said, she's just made me really angry. There wasn't any sense of remorse. No, from and, you know, I was hoping to see something like that from him, but, you know, I never did at the time, no. Mark told police it was an accident caused by him leaning over to wind down the window. But the video showed the truth and became vital evidence, as did Aidan's testimony of seeing his mother being pulled behind the truck. Sandy's husband, Mark Burt, was charged with more than 20 offences, 17 for breaching a restraining order and two for intending to do harm, which each carry a maximum jail sentence of 20 years. But when it came to the court case, like many victims of domestic violence in Australia, Sandy believes the justice system failed her. A plea bargain was struck. Mark pleading guilty on all counts. Sentenced to five years in prison with parole after three, Mark could be free as early as mid-2017. I mean, this is a complete joke. This bloke, he, he tried to kill me. That was his whole thing that day. He knew not to approach. Legally, he was not allowed to approach. He didn't care. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, and that was set in his mind that day to do. There was very little insight into the actual depth of the violence that had happened and the extreme terror that that woman had felt and experienced over that period of time. That wasn't reflected in the judge's comments or in the sentencing. And knowing that, you know, they'd been almost dragged around with a noose around your neck in itself, it's domestic terrorism. Okay. Um, Mary Ann, the rose garden that we've planted here is in. In front of the refuge that Anne Moore runs, there's a flourishing rose garden, but for all the wrong reasons. Each bush represents a woman or child the refuge helped, but whose life was still lost to domestic violence. I just am astounded at the extent of the violence that we witness every single day. It is, it's a, it is a national disgrace. Domestic violence, we all think of, it's just the man bashing the woman, but it's a lot more than that, a lot more. It's a destruction of the family. It's a betrayal of trust. Free of oppression, Sandy Wolfe is now reclaiming her life and looking to help other victims by speaking out. But there's little doubt she and her children will be haunted by their violent past for years to come. I don't ever want to be like my old man. I want to be totally different on five kids. That I don't want them to have a great, great childhood. Grow up to love their dad, not, not resent them. Well, you know what I mean. Like, 
grab hold. But yeah, I was worried about, I was going to follow my mother's footsteps. Because I've always, I've always been just like my mum. But I hope I don't get a relationship like that though. It's a, such a daunting thing to just walk out the door with nothing, but it can be done. And it's not that you have nothing. You walk out with your life. You walk out with an inner strength that you end up finding and a peace, finally. You don't have to put up with that kind of treatment. That's not a love. That's not how love is supposed to be. Love should be unconditional. And when someone starts putting conditions on you, they don't love you. They just want to control you.